everyone and welcome. My name is Sandhya Simhan and I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications at DeepLearning.ai. We appreciate you taking some time out to join us for this event. At DeepLearning.ai, our mission is to make world-class AI education accessible to everyone. We aim to empower our community of aspiring and current machine learning practitioners to be a part of the AI transformation that is happening across so many industries. Besides building new courses, Part of that work is to help our learners sort out the steps after finishing our courses, including how to land your first machine learning job. Last month, we assembled a panel of technical recruiters to share their tips with you. If you missed that event, scroll down to the event description for a link to the YouTube recording. Today, we have panelists who have successfully made the transition from online courses to now working in AI for a few years. They'll be sharing their first-hand suggestions on potential career paths, as well as tips and best practices for interview prep. You can find the list of topics we'll be covering in the first half of in the event description. Afterwards, we'll be taking questions from the community via Slido. Only the people who have signed up for the Slido ticket will be able to access the page to post and upvote questions. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our panel speakers. They are Nissin, Nithin Pasumarthi, Senior Applied Machine Learning Engineer at LinkedIn. Hi, everyone. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Daniel Popescu, a Machine Learning Engineer at Arcris. Hello. And Kennedy Wangari, data scientist at SafeBoda and an incoming data science intern at NVIDIA. Hi, thank you for having me for this session. Yes, I'm very excited to have all of you here with us. Uh, for the next 40 minutes or so, I'll be asking some questions to our panelists. While I'll direct questions to a specific person, I'd also like to encourage any of you on the panel to jump in, offer your input in the conversation. So let's start off with a brief introduction from everyone. Uh, Nitin, do you wanna go first? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Nitin Pasmarthi from uh, LinkedIn. And uh, I've been working at LinkedIn for almost three years. And right now I am working on applied machine learning problems for performance at LinkedIn. Daniel? Uh, hello, I'm Daniel. Um, I'm I've been working as a machine learning engineer for about two years. Before that, I worked as a web developer for almost seven, eight years. Um, yeah. <laughs> and Kennedy. Good, thank you. Um, I'm Kennedy Wangari, uh, currently working uh, with Safe Border uh, as a data scientist. And uh, currently just uh, working on uh, um, trying to improve our uh, um, uh, machine learning uh, uh, workflows to uh, be able to help us uh, improve in terms of uh, uh, understanding our customer journey and uh, thank you. Awesome. Um, so obviously we know a little bit about what each of you guys do right now, but I'd love to just kind of go back to the beginning. So um, can each of you tell us what is your background? What were you doing before you even heard of the word machine learning? And then how did you first get started in, in AI? Daniel? Uh, yeah, <laughs> my, uh, my story is quite funny in a way because uh, so I, I was working as a web developer for a lot of years up till then. Um, and at some point I kind of uh, had a middle life crisis, but earlier <laughs> and uh, decided I kind of want to see more, do, do, do more. And uh, actually took a sabbatical in which I just uh, went and started learning other, other technologies, other stuff. I uh, ended up starting the deep learning AI specialization. Um, after the first course, <clears throat> I was actually pretty hooked and already in love with uh, machine learning. So after that, it was just a uphill <laughs> uh, thing where uh, I started uh, doing uh, courses and slowly building up uh, my knowledge in the, in the area. Very cool. Nathan, I saw you nodding a lot as Daniel was talking. Do you want to share your story? Yeah, sure. Uh, I share a very similar uh, experience like Daniel. I was also uh, a software engineer web developer for a long time before joining LinkedIn. Around four years back uh, at Apple, I was a data analysis uh, a tool designer where kind of used my web designing and software engineering skills to make robust uh, big data analysis tools. And with a slight focus in distributed uh, databases, which was my thesis during masters. So I had a typical computer science background and uh, 
like many of you i wanted to solve uh, real world challenging problems using like smart algorithms so for example instead of building a medicines catalog app which can catalog all the medicines i wanted to make it more useful if it like make some initial diagnosis and that's where after talking to a lot of friends and doing a lot of blog reading i realized maybe machine learning is the way to solve such problems so i said myself becoming an applied machine learning engineer since then as the next career path uh, since 2017 ish very cool and then kennedy uh, chris um my background is uh, in information t- technology uh, that's the undergraduate uh, degree that uh, i pursued uh, and uh, currently i'm uh, preparing myself to uh, pursue a masters uh, uh, degree program at the university of michigan and uh, looking at how i started uh, in ai uh, i could say uh, this was way from uh, when i secured uh, a business intelligence analyst intern uh, internship role with a local bank uh, here in kenya uh, and uh, during that time period uh, working with uh, the various data teams uh, it made me realize my passion working with data and also uh, uh, trying to uh, solve uh, various uh, customer problems with data and uh, this really sparked uh, interest and uh, fueled me to uh, uh, in terms of uh, any activities in terms of uh, all other work that came after uh, my ba internship role uh, at that bank and uh, looking at how the bank was applying ai applications to try and solve uh, uh, various customer problems and also looking at uh, the various ways that ai was uh, providing new techniques to solve problems in the bank uh, made me feel more excited and uh, uh, i could say that's how uh, i started uh, um, my journey into uh, the data science field and uh, having a strong background in software engineering and uh, bi it was quite easier now to take up uh, uh, the deep learning dot ai courses and uh, long story short uh, here we are joining nvidia next year yes and congratulations on the nvidia uh, position um thank you i'd love to i'd love for you guys to share a little bit about how did you choose to even apply for the current positions you're in uh, daniel uh, oh, okay <clears throat> um for me uh, at, at some point i started uh, specializing in nlp um and uh, while i was working on small projects on my own i actually got uh, presented uh, with uh, with a job so i i didn't really apply uh i was just around on linkedin and things like that and uh, uh they saw my interest in nlp and that was very similar with uh, the projects that uh, the startup was working on uh uh we are working on a chatbot that uh, interviews people and uh, helps uh, hr with uh, different uh, processes mm-hmm. and uh yeah so uh, for me it was a bit different cuz uh, i was actually approached not uh, i didn't uh, start uh, looking for a job uh, from the start but that's actually quite a nice thing cuz uh, you know i I did a lot of courses and uh, I didn't have to uh, start looking for something I kind of was approached already by someone else based on the uh, credentials that I was getting from uh, Coursera. Got it. Well, that's a pretty wonderful scenario. Um Kennedy yeah. and Nitin, <laughs> did you guys have a similar experience? Uh, I could say um after completing my first uh, BA uh, internship role in 2018 and then going back again in 2019 to the same same bank now as a data science intern uh, i could say at that point now uh, after my internship um, my main question was what next and uh, while uh, still thinking of uh, uh, how i could now be able to maybe get a role to help me now be able to grow uh, uh, in, uh, in the industry and gain more skills at the same time also working uh, at that point that's when i was uh, reached out uh, uh, by uh, an, uh, a certain uh, firm uh, and um, Uh, that's how I was able to uh, uh, start my first uh, full-time data science role, uh, but uh, because of the culture there, I did not be. I was not. I didn't stay for long, and uh, that's how I was also reached out by the team at Safe Border. 
And uh, I could say that uh, uh, the skills that I gained uh, from the deep learning the AI courses uh, uh, really helped me in terms of uh, being able to structure various projects, being able to uh, uh, confidently work on uh, various data science and machine learning projects. And I can say uh, at Safe Board, uh, majorly my work has been uh, all around uh, uh, predictive marketing analytics. Uh, for the last six months that I've been there, I've worked on a couple of projects, helping the sales and marketing team on uh, optimizing marketing campaigns. Uh, working on uh, uh, targeting of various uh, products to various customers and understanding their behaviors. Uh, and I can say uh, currently uh, my uh, what I'm doing right now is working with the various uh, data teams that are there to, uh, like I did mention earlier, to see how can we improve uh, how uh, our pipelines, that is the data science and machine learning pipelines, to be able to uh, ingest more data, to be able to streamline our processes so that uh, we're able to get more customer engagement data to help us uh, with the sales team in terms of uh, uh, um, uh, being able to uh, understand more to the customer journey and all that. So uh, that's uh, uh, what I'm doing currently and also uh, how I was able to get to my current position. Fair enough. And Nitin? So my story is a little different than uh, Daniel and Kennedy. So uh, I was a web developer and for a long time, I was only building websites and doing some little bit of databases, but I wanted to like, uh, like use ML knowledge that I gained from the deep learning AI courses to eventually reach where I wanted to reach. So I started doing a lot of pet projects, but I was unable to scale uh, given the amount of work at office and immediately after the office work doing these pet projects. So um, I started applying for roles, which are close to web designing, but also have a scope for doing more optimization and performance work, not directly ML, but kind of closer in that direction. Mm. So which I felt was a little good middle ground. So because I have some skills that I can showcase in the interview and like prove to them that, okay, I am good at these things. And also those optimization and performance uh, kind of uh, tasks can uh, let me apply ML knowledge is what I thought initially, that was the plan. And uh, with that plan, I just updated my LinkedIn profile and updated the title and stuff. And I was approached by a LinkedIn recruiter funnily very soon. Apparently LinkedIn recruiters use their own product. <laughs> yeah, it looks like, yeah, immediately. I mean, that was instantaneous. Okay. And uh, can I ask what sort, when you were, when you were identifying you know, this is, I'm currently a web developer. I'm looking for, you know, X role that has both a little bit of web development, but also a little bit of optimization stuff where I can start using ML versus, you know, full on machine learning engineering. Um, what were the sort of role titles that you were looking at as sort of that middle ground? So uh, I don't know if it was a standard then uh, or it is now, but like it's more of a standard now is what I feel. But that time I felt machine learning is a little too direct and I may not be uh, able to crack such kind of uh, roles. So I started phrasing myself as apply machine learning in web. Mm. So, so something in, in between. So applying machine learning knowledge with my web designing skills. Got it, like in your domain expertise. Yeah, exactly, right. Okay, very cool, yeah. Um, the lack of standardization of titles is something we hear from our learners a lot. Like, you know, a data scientist at one place is not a data scientist at another place. You know, it's a machine learning researcher instead. And so that that can get confusing. Um, one of our sister companies, WorkEra, is trying to resolve that as best as they can by creating more, you know, industry-wide assessments, but it's definitely still a work in progress and it's very nation. So I appreciate that, you know, it's hard to explain like, this is how much I can do in, yeah. you know, like the, what is it? hundred characters that you have in a, in a yeah. LinkedIn title. Um, so uh, I know that all of you guys obviously have done uh, more than just take courses uh, as part of your uh, progress towards, you know, becoming machine learning engineers and, and data scientists. Um, so I was wondering if you could, if any of you could chat a little bit about, you know, what did you do to build your portfolio to actually show a recruiter that reached out, hey, I actually have, you know, like relevant skill sets that are, that I've applied. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll try to go first. Um, I, I, after after I did the, a bit of uh, the deep learning specializations and some other specializations actually also from Coursera, 
uh, I started applying them in a way in uh, casual competitions, which I guess most of uh, the users watching right now know about. Um, that was really a great thing because uh, up, till the, up till that point, uh, you know, in the courses, you, you get theoretical information and you kind of do something practical, but really uh, with uh, your hand hold it. Uh, and in the Kaggle competition, you actually get to work with big data, very big data in a way, but also just are free to test and do whatever level you feel comfortable with, you know. And uh, also a great tool is the, the community there because you get a lot of other uh, solutions from other people during the competition, you know. So you, you learn quite a lot in, in, that, uh, in that time. I, I can say that at my first competition, I mean, I, I didn't do any good, but uh, I learned so much, uh, like applying the knowledge I had. And also like, uh, it was one of the first times that uh, I was like, okay, so I don't need to look uh, in, at Stack Overflow for this. <laughs> I, I kind of know what to do. Uh, I just need to test it, you know? Yeah. That, that, was, uh, that was quite interesting. Yeah. That's a pretty awesome feeling that first time that you're like, hey, I did this from my brain. Yeah, yeah. And that's uh, all after seven years of uh, web development, you know, and granted there you, you have to, to search a lot of other things because it's quite uh, picky, but. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. pretty cool. And so what were you, what platform were you using? Um, uh, what, what do you mean? What, what platform were you using for competitions? Like, was it? Kaggle, was it something else? Oh, it was Kaggle. It was Kaggle, the, the main, the main Kaggle competitions. Yeah. Okay. Like cool. whatever I found uh, at that moment to be, to, that I liked, the competition that I liked, I went for it. After a while, I started uh, liking just NLP competitions. <laughs> so I only tried those, but. Uh, Is, yeah. Are the competitions how you decided that, hey, NLP is the area that I want to focus in on? Uh, kind of, yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I really can't remember right now what was the competition. The, it was something from Google, I think. Um, and at some point I just uh, started uh, working in at the project of the competition, but uh, uh, at some point during that, I actually started linking something that I read in a paper that was supposed to help me with the competition, you know? But uh, it was so interesting that I kind of uh, left the competition and just started working on that thing because uh, it, it was more interesting at the moment. And yeah. that's from, from that moment on, I kind of went to NLP and made a whole plan for me to start uh, get, gathering knowledge in that area and specialize yeah. myself in a way. Yeah. And after that, after like three, four months of that, uh, I got approached by... Uh, by the current company that I'm working with. Got it. And Kennedy, um, I know you've done a lot uh, besides just courses um, as part of, you know, building out your professional network and such. Do you, would you mind chatting with us a little bit about that? Uh, great. Uh, I could say for me, um, I've uh, explored different ways that uh, uh, really helped me uh, to be able to build uh, a, a good portfolio. Uh, one way is that uh, uh, I was able to uh, be able to take up two uh, BI and data science uh, related internships that uh, provided a, a great uh, foundation. Uh, I've also uh, been involved uh, in taking up uh, real world projects with uh, various companies such as Omdena and also Google AI for social good. Uh, and also uh, uh, I've also been able to take part and participate in a couple of uh, data science hackathons and uh, uh, competitions. Uh, and uh, more to that, um, I've, I'm one person who is quite passionate when it comes to AI communities. So I've been involved with learning uh, at the same time, also working with AI communities, collaborating and doing a couple of projects. And I could say more to that, I also have a group uh, of my friends. We have uh, a paper reading club. So uh, we always get to uh, uh, do deep learning literature. We're able to summarize machine learning papers. 
and above all, I could say I'm actively involved uh, in open source work. I believe uh, uh, most of us have, in one way or the other, come across uh, maybe my data science posts or opinions or uh, basically sh getting to share more to uh, either my projects or uh, sharing more to various topics in data science, machine learning practice and all that. And I can say uh, all that in Lamsum have really, uh, have really helped me to be able to build a good portfolio and also be able to uh, introduce me to uh, other uh, professionals in the field and uh, get to engage more and yeah. Awesome. Um, and I think something that Kennedy has been is being very humble about is the fact that he's one of our most active event ambassadors as part of the Pi and AI community meetups that Deep Learning hosts um, and has been a key part of what makes um, the, the Kenyan uh, chapters uh, so successful as well. Um, and Nithin, um, I know that you, did you approach uh, competitions as sort of a way to help you showcase and, and, and pick up uh, you know, the skills that you wanted? Or was there something else that you did? So yeah, like just like Daniel, I tried uh, attending some competitions, but I was not good at it initially. So uh, so I started doing my own stuff, learning more uh, about the machine learning concepts. But slowly, um, I picked up the momentum and understand it, uh, understood what's actually that is the core concept that was missing. So went back to the course and did, and I started doing much better. But then. At that time around, I was approached by LinkedIn and uh, there I got a chance to really work on some real projects and apply the knowledge that I gained from all these sources in that project and build quick prototypes. And that really helped like revise, revise and apply, revise and apply. That cycle really helped me get better at it. Oh, that makes sense. It seems like for all of you, it, nothing really quite beats actually doing the work you know, getting in there, actually trying it out, practicing and practicing with it in various, you know, um, incarnations until you feel more secure in your skills. That's a really great takeaway for our audience. Um, I would love to uh, now ask, well, I think one of the questions we get from our learners very frequently is, how do I know that I'm ready to work in the machine learning industry? And it seems like all of you uh, approached it through um, less of a, you know, binary system of like, oh, I'm in and then nope, I'm all the way in. Yeah. Um, and instead you found a more incremental approach. Um, what would you recommend uh, for people as like sort of, you know, okay, hey, I've completed a specialization. I've completed, you know, DLS, for example. Like, what do I do now? Um, from my point of view, I, I actually get this question quite a lot. In, in the past year, I've got this question quite a lot. And uh, uh, I, what's interesting is that I got it from persons in very various uh, stages. Like one person was with uh, eight courses already done. One was only with one. One was already a senior engineer at some some big firm, and so on. So uh, it really varies. And I, I would say that you know when you when you start doing a bit of uh, a bit of applied work and see that you can handle uh, building a project like uh, doing all the steps. You know. Uh, uh, gathering the data, uh, selecting the features, training, uh, and redoing all those steps till till it gets better. At that point, you already are kind of ready. It just depends on how high you want to aim. Like uh, you know, uh, there are very various uh, levels of, uh, of jobs uh, out there. So it really depends on how much time you have left to learn. Like if you. Uh, if you're like me, like I, I took a sabbatical, which I know I knew was for a, a bit over six months, then I I uh, allowed myself all those six months to learn more and more and more. You know, uh, I, I felt like I was ready around the three months mark. But uh, uh, if you have time, I, I guess just uh, learn as much as you can. And then I think you're pretty ready already <laughs> in most cases. Mm -hmm. it, it really depends on uh, what, what level you want to, to work on. That's a really fair point. Nathan, you look like you had something to say. Yeah, I just want to add to that saying, 
um it 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 all depends like if you feel that you are able to perform all the different stages of the pipeline the work era report that you are referring to has a very nice way to uh describe your role succinctly based on the skill sets that you have gained over doing the while doing these courses so i think um some data scientist ex, uh, expect maybe modeling and feature engineering so maybe if those are the things that you are uh, you feel confident about doing say in a real project uh, in a company then i think trying to f- going deep in that uh, particular stack also helps to get a job faster and you can at least start there immediately by applying in those roles as well Oh, that's very fair. Um, to play devil's advocate here, would you say that there is a base level of multiple things that uh, a machine learning engineer or data scientist needs to learn first and then before you specialize? Or do you think that, you know, the specialization is, is beneficial in and of itself, especially when, you know, you're applying for larger companies that tend to have more specialized roles? That's, uh, uh-huh. yeah, go ahead, Daniel. No, go, go ahead. <laughs> uh so that's a very good question uh so whether we want to go broad or whether we want to want to go deep it totally like depends on uh, the interest because all the skills that are required for an ml project are very different so i i had a database system background so feature processing was kind of an easy thing to tra- like tackle first for me and go deep but at the same time i was spending enough amount of time on modeling as well so that was the thing that i kind of tried to focus on in my early projects in ml and also work with other teammates in the the company to learn the other aspects so my journey was like deep and as well go broad but it can work the other way for others as well yeah related to this to to the question i i mean i i really think that the basics in this area in, in machine learning are much more important than in other uh, in other jobs you know like for example uh, as i said i was a web developer the basics there were were also important but not as much not like you could start uh, uh, learning a framework without knowing everything that's going uh, uh, behind it you know but in uh, in machine learning you can't really i mean you can use keras for example <laughs> without uh, knowing too much but it won't help you go very far with without knowing the basics and actually what's going underneath that so uh, this much more than in other jobs uh, really needs uh, the basics to be to be known well you know I, I'm kind of a perfectionist, so I, for example, for me, I did uh, like three courses of the basics. <laughs> I did the deep learning specialization, then I did the uh, uh, machine learning from Mandarin G. Then I did another thing uh, that was going through papers of the basic things. So, but that that's because I'm a bit uh, crazy with <laughs> really putting them. Uh, Uh, clearly in my mind but still uh, i mean i think uh, the basics are very very important uh, for this job especially yeah. kennedy uh, you look like you had something to say um i i would also get to uh, just build up to what uh, uh, daniel uh, uh, has said that uh, um um once you uh, I've been able to build your foundational skills uh with uh, the, the deep learning data specialization uh, and uh, you could opt maybe to take up either go in depth or cover breadth wise uh, and uh, as you get you continue to build up uh, your competencies uh, while taking up the projects um uh, it gets to point uh, you, uh, one thing is you will never get uh, at any point where you will feel that uh, you are ready to apply for any role uh, and you have to take that courage uh, and uh, be confident that uh, with the skills that you've gained 
uh, you're able to build uh, solutions and you're able to take up roles. And uh, uh, that's why uh, I always uh, I prefer the mode of uh, uh, once you've uh, like net inside, once you've been able to learn the basics of uh, almost each and every part of the workflows, uh, and you can be able to build a simple model. Uh, the best, uh, I think, what would work best for me is uh, if you're able to build a, a real world application, whether it's a simple project. Uh, and uh, you continue growing on that, uh, you, you get to a point where you feel you're confident and you can be able to even take up uh, complex projects and uh, uh, you can be able to apply for any role uh, to uh, that excites you either to maybe in a specific niche area or uh, maybe depending if you just want to cover breadth-wise of the various topics that are there. And uh, again, I would say uh, you never get to uh, any point that you feel that uh, you're ready to apply for any specific role, but go ahead, apply for that role and uh, 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 showcase to them that uh, you can be able to solve problems, you are an innovator and you can build end-to-end -end solutions. Got it, very solid advice. Very bold advice too. It's like, take that first step, make that leap. Um, uh, I know uh, I know we've been chatting a lot about sort of, you know, getting ready to apply for that first machine learning job, but, uh, one of the biggest, uh, maybe scariest aspects of actually landing a job is the interview process. And so I was wondering if you guys would be willing to share a little bit about how, you know, although all three of you were approached in various capacities by the recruiters, um, you know, when we were going through the interview, what was the most, um, you know, uh, I guess like what was the most apprehensive part and how did you prepare for it? Maybe it could go first. Uh, uh, briefly, maybe sharing uh, uh, more to my interview experience with NVIDIA. Uh, and uh, I could say it's, it, it was one quite uh, intensive and uh, thorough uh, rounds of interview. Uh, there were three rounds of interview, and uh, they started by one uh, being uh, reached out uh, by a uh, uh, NVIDIA uh, recruiter. And uh, we had just a quick um, uh, initial uh, phone screen call. Uh, there was more of uh, basically getting to understand more to my personality uh, and uh, compatibility and also taking me through the opportunities that were there at uh, NVIDIA. And then after that, uh, I was invited now for the first round of interview. Uh, and um, uh, uh, coming into, into this interview uh, with already an understanding of what the role was all about, uh, it was heavy, it had heavy product components. Uh, and um, uh, the questions were all uh, majorly around uh, uh, statistics and um, A-B testing, more of uh, designing and analyzing experiments. And also during that time, I was also uh, able to have a technical discussion on uh, 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 my previous experiences and the projects that I'd done, and then moved on now to the second uh, round of interview. And uh, during this interview process, um, it was also um, uh, heavily technical, but it was more involved now on the specific role with uh, engaging more on a use case uh, project scenario uh, where we engaged and then I was also able to make a submission uh, and also a coding interview. And uh, lastly, I was uh, having achieved satisfactory results. I was now invited to the third round. Uh, the third round was very brief. Uh, and uh, in this round, uh, I was um, interviewing with uh, the team lead for uh, the Data Rapids team at NVIDIA. Uh, and uh, the session was very brief, but also technical. Uh, and um, lastly, after that, after maybe a, a week, I was able to receive the offer. And then um, now building up to the second part of your question, how I was able to prepare for this role, uh, I could really say that uh, one way that uh, really helped me was um, I was able to research intensively, both uh, uh, from uh, the internal teams uh, and also uh, from uh, what is already out there in the internet to be able to understand uh, the kind of projects NVIDIA was working on, uh, the challenges that they were going through, their goals and all that. And this really helped me to have insights uh, to uh, understand uh, more to the company. I was also able to do more research around uh, the specific role, uh, what is expected and all that. And uh, also uh, before coming to all these rounds of interviews, uh, I spent a great time to um, understand more to the profiles of uh, the interviewing team uh, to be able to understand what is uh, the uh, existing work uh, that is out there, what is their opinions, what do they, what have they shared out there, uh, and maybe going to look at various sources to understand more to them. And this helped me to be able to build a couple of questions to at least have a good conversation and all that with them. Um, and uh, also uh, another thing that really helped me was um, 
uh, with the internal teams at Nvidia uh, through the engagements with them, I was able to understand more to the ongoing projects and uh, what they were aiming to do. So this really helped me to form also a good baseline uh, when having the conversation with him. And another thing that really helped me being the fact that uh, this was a product-based role, um, I tried to interact with some of their products. And uh, during the sessions, I was able to share with them some of the feedback based on how I was able to interact with these products. Um, and uh, also um, all these uh, intensive research engagements uh, uh, really helped me to uh, be able to um, uh, come up with valuable questions to ask the teams. Because uh, one thing that I know is that uh, uh, if um, uh, you're able to ask insightful questions to the business, it means that you understand the problems and you can be able to have a good conversation with them. Uh, and also lastly, I was able to use some of the resources out there like uh, the uh, Crack the Coding interview, uh, for the coding questions. And also uh, I, I, I looked at, uh, I practiced a good number of mock-up uh, data science interviews, uh, SQL, um, statistics, encoding, and um, all these collectively uh, really helped me to be able to confidently go through the three rounds uh, and uh, finally land an offer. So uh, that is a brief up of uh, uh, my whole interview process and uh, what uh, greatly helped me to be able to secure the role of where I'll be joining the video next year. Uh, that is a fantastically thorough review of what you did to prep. Thank you. I'm sure, I'm sure our learners will really appreciate that. Um, Daniel or Nithin, is there anything that um, additional that you guys felt was helpful when you were preparing for your respective interviews? <laughs> I don't think additionally we could add <laughs> to that. It was pretty comprehensive already. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I do have a, a little bit of a curveball question, um, and perhaps Daniel or Nathan, you'd be able to answer this. When you were preparing, you know, when you were trying to figure out, like, well, what what exactly uh, will this role entail? What are the exact responsibilities, and what sort of you know um, specific domain expertise do I need to pick up in order to be successful at this role? Um, were you able to use uh, you know the the job listing as a source of that kind of information? Or did you feel that it was the conversations with the recruiters that were, you know, really allowed you to really understand what the role required? Uh, I can start. So uh, in, in my opinion, talking to the recruiter really helps, uh, especially given, like I said before, AI landscape was quite broad. ML engineer, applied scientist, applied machine learning engineer, so many varieties are uh, exist today. While that is still getting standardized, I think if you can share your skills and interests and intent of what you want to work on very clearly on your resume and also on your LinkedIn profile or wherever, it really helps. Uh, I mean, they can help you connect with the right teams and they can also help you connect to have the right kind of interviews. Like if I may not be great at data processing or distributed systems, but that is an expected thing for a machine learning engineer. So if I set that out straight in the beginning, they will have maybe a, a lighter version of that particular round and a more aggressive version of the other rounds, which I'm confident on. It is certainly possible to fine tune the rounds based on the skill set. It's just, we need to share it upright and clearly. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Like, uh, I think uh, you do get a lot of information from the from just the job description in a way. You you know what to prepare. Uh, but again, I, I would go to to the basics in a way. Like uh, uh, Kennedy and Nitin were kind of, kind of now at the more senior level in a way. Uh, I would. I would uh, explain a bit more for, for juniors in a way, maybe, because um, for example, for my company, we're, <clears throat> we're preparing to uh, extend the team in a way, a bit, and uh, that will be kind of my, uh, my role. Uh, and uh, what I started preparing and what I, when, what I know I want to look for most is, uh, is that uh, the candidate can really go confidently and on its own mostly through those uh, th through those important steps like uh, you know uh, understanding the data correctly 
uh, being able to research because uh, in, in machine learning, a big part of it is research. Even if you don't go on a research, uh, you know, um, you, still, you still need a lot of uh, research capabilities in a way. Um, you mean like and of course, or something else? Sorry? When you say like research capabilities, do you mean research papers or? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I mean res research papers that come from uh, uh, conferences uh, uh, for the, the specific task, like, uh, uh, yeah, for the specific task, because it's very, it's very specific. Um, that, that, that is quite important. Like, I, I know for sure, uh, uh, Nitin and Kennedy can maybe attest to that, that uh, they had to, to read a lot uh, uh, since they, they got the, the job and uh, started working. Um, yeah, and I, I guess that, that would be a huge, uh, huge plus in a way. And of course, uh, being able to uh, understand the models and you know, go, go a bit beyond the basics of them, like, uh, uh, it, it's not really enough to, to know uh, the basic that you see on every tutorial out there online. Uh, it's good if you are able to tell me uh, more specific things like, uh, yeah, but if you remove this layer and add something else, you get uh, something completely different and why, you know, the, the why is very important in, <laughs> in this case. Yeah. Okay. No, that, that's, that's a really valid point. Um, I know that one of the things that we hear is, you know, I, I take these courses, I learn the, the basics of the information, but the really only way to keep up with the latest knowledge is to, is to be in there and, and reading the research papers and, and really digesting them. Um, I know Kennedy mentioned a, a paper reading circle uh, or group that he has to help sort of, you know, help people uh, you know, get a better handle on research papers that are coming out. I obviously have to tout the batch, um, which is uh, you know, where we uh, summarize research papers for subscribers. But is there, are there any resources or tactics that you use, um, Daniel and Nithin, in terms of you know, helping sure that you're keeping up to date with the latest research that's relevant to your work? Uh, for, for me, uh, at some point, uh, I think around the beginning of this year, I made the challenge for myself, like uh, read one paper a day, which wasn't easy because a paper is pretty big. Uh, to, to really understand it, you, you need to like uh, uh, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of time. Um, but th that was with great, great uh, effects like... Uh, it was hard, it took a lot of time, but uh, I did it for about uh, two months and a half. Then I slowed down because I work and other things, you know, <laughs> you don't really get to do it uh, forever. Um, but uh, I learned like so much uh, because, of the, because of it. And I still try to uh, do it like uh, to read at least one paper a week or something like that. Um, and mostly I'm, I'm using at, at the start, of course, you need some kind of uh, roadmap or something like that. But after you start, uh, I'm pretty sure that this goes for everybody. After you start, you'll kind of know what you want to read next because uh, it, it links together. You know, it's uh, you, you find the specialization in a way, and then you know that uh, uh, oh, this this uh, you see some newsletters, and you know. Okay, this one uh, is really interesting for me. I'll, I'll put it in the in the reading list, kind of, you know. Right. Oh, that makes sense. Nitin, was there something you wanted to add? Yeah, like uh, one one slight uh, thing I would like to add is, so there are a lot of uh, websites like Papers with Code, um, or I think probably I forget the name exactly, but they kind of digest just like batch does they kind of digest the most important aspects of papers and put them in easy to understand manner if uh, i found some papers quite uh, relevant to my job 
and uh, right, math can be very daunting and i think it might scare uh, at least it scares me away when i see a lot of math in paper so the way i do it is uh, look at the code that they published on github and try to like break it down play it on jupyter notebook try to delete some lines and like execute some functions so some core math topics which i am not able to follow immediately i try to understand them as black boxes a small unit of work what does it do slowly i think uh, i understand the entire landscape of the paper what they are trying to do like that i i would like to to say something regarding this regarding the math thing like uh, when i after i did the first specialization i was uh, I started reading some papers and like uh, like Nitin I was very scared <laughs> because I I realized okay so I understand just the first chapter and <laughs> that's about it um and um because I I wasn't good at math I I'm a good programmer but not good at math <laughs> um but uh, because of actually because of the love for the field i decided to get good at it in a way and uh, actually i took a specialization i think it was called mathematics from 4 ml or something like that also from coursera and uh, can't say that uh, now i'm uh, okay an expert or something but um, i do understand uh, the papers a lot better you know um our founder andrew ing is is very famous for saying you know don't worry about the math Um, yeah. but it seems uh you know what you guys are saying is you know at first you may not need to worry about it but it does help the more advanced you get to have that grounding yeah yeah and uh, i mean in a way it's true don't worry about the math cuz i mean look <laughs> i wasn't good at math at all but uh, i i really managed to get uh, ahead of it uh, just by pushing through little by little and like nita said uh, i liked a lot like, what he said like uh, what you don't really understand too much you view it as a black box and uh, move forward hmm. what would you say to people who are sort of in the opposite boat uh, boat uh, let's say they they might be decent at math but don't have as you know software or programming backgrounds maybe they come from a non technical background so you know they've done calculus and advanced calculus maybe in college but they don't they've never done a master's degree they don't have a computer science degree they're you know relatively new to python where would you recommend that they start um i i would i would recommend that uh, they start with uh, learning programming at first like algorithm algorithmic I, i mean kind of uh it will be easier for them i know that for a fact like uh, I, i taught at university algorithmics for for two years and uh I saw that indeed for for those with stronger math uh, background it's kind of easier because it's similar structure like more logical and things like that um but yeah I I I say I would say start with the algorithmics first because you do need it uh I mean I guess you could be a data scientist data scientist in the other uh, meaning of the word like uh, working more with data but uh, not doing uh, models and training things um but uh, if you want to uh, apply a bit more of everything in uh, in the field then of course you you have to get a bit of uh, basics in programming also it, it doesn't have to be like uh, you don't you don't have to be able to uh, solve uh, big problems to, that uh, are given at google or things like that you know but uh, basics were there any resources that any of you used um when you said hey like you know i'm approaching a machine learning problem and i don't think my programming skills are good enough or i don't have the necessary expertise what were the resources that you used to sort of go all right this is how i refine you know the the pencil sharpener for your skills if you will Mm, I can try that. Um, so the way I would say that uh, to attack that problem is uh, coming directly from my friend, uh, 
who was completely in a non programming computer science background and he was very good at machine learning but not uh, comfortable with programming so i would just tell what he did i think that will be easier uh, so all he did was use uh, very solid packages which do most of the software engineering for him let's say keras uh it gets you started very quickly with 15 to 20 lines of code and most of the code is pythonic and python is known to be very human readable and friendly language so he was able to get started and get comfortable with some concepts basic concepts what is a class what is a module and that's it and once he started uh, working on big teams in company uh software engineering skills became, became more important so he took courses on design patterns how to write a efficient code using solid principles like do not repeat yourself those kind of things became necessary like it came from the necessity and those kind of topics he asked me or anyone like i was in that background so he was he was asking me continuously and i was able to point to him okay read this uh, blog post or read this check out this video and like keep him focused and also give him the depth wherever he needs for that problem so yeah like collaborating with friends talking to them and getting the skills whatever skills that are missing is one easy way to do it yeah no that's very fair um i i also have a i guess a question around uh sort of the verticalization of a platform so um you know one of our founder one of the big things that he he feels is like the future of ai that sort of allows ai to kind of take the next step forward is uh the verticalization of platform so um something that's relevant not just for you know any sort of visual inspection but specifically to manufacturing that allows you know um people to utilize like the the general public or or general companies to better utilize machine learning more rapidly because it's much closer to what they need for their end state. Um I know Kennedy you mentioned, you know, you have experience in in fintech um in, in banking and uh that that's where you spent a a small chunk of your career already. And so I was wondering were there um any tools or resources you utilized to you know understand what those specialized platforms for your industry were or vertical were and then how did you you know identify them and how did you learn about them uh, great uh, i can say uh, when uh, i first uh, joined uh, the local bank uh, as a business intelligence a ba intern uh, i was uh, a bit new to working with uh, the oracle uh, platform uh, but uh, i could say that uh, the, uh, the the teams are always provided with their uh, training programs so i was able to be paired with uh, my uh, supervisor and i was able to go through uh, a one week session uh, and uh, i was able to upskill and uh, be able to transfer the skills that uh, i had learned in biz- uh, business intelligence and data warehousing so that is one way uh, and also another way that um, I also was able to benefit uh, while undertaking my first internship and also my second internship now as a data science intern was that uh, 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 the uh, the bank uh, does provide uh, uh, training opportunities whereby you're able to access uh, uh, learning courses and programs uh, uh, on various platforms. Like uh, I could like take my example, I, I was able to take up uh, the data analysis uh, uh, Udacity program. And uh, also like I could say that uh, the Coursera courses are really also help me to augment my skills and uh, for the specific uh, platforms like uh, t- uh, during uh, while working with the bank um, i was able to get access to those training programs uh, and uh, also uh, able to have that mentorship from them and uh, uh, one thing i would like to say is that i was able to receive my first data science mentor while still working in the bank so all these collectively really helped me from the mentorship access to opportunities uh, helped me to be able to step up and uh, be able to uh, execute my tasks effectively. There we go. Uh, We're now gonna shift over to um, some questions from the community uh, through the Slido platform. Um, So one of the questions that has come up is, you know, how can I build experience in machine learning if I don't match, you know, what they're looking for. Um, if I, you know, I look at a job requirement, I'm not quite a good fit for it. 
um, I guess I'd like to take that question and tune it a little bit and say, instead, like, how do you find machine learning jobs that are applicable or that you are qualified for? What's the, what's the process by which you look at those requirements? Um, I can give it a shot. Or, um, so again, like the style is uh, totally depends on how you want to approach this. It's a, it's, there is no single way as such. Um, one way is try to go closer to the uh, domain you are in, already skilled at because companies would also want to get something out of you, right? Like it's, if, if totally you're going into a new domain, which is not tested and not like tried out or proven somewhere else, uh, they may not like immediately give you, give an offer. So trying closer to the domain and also at the same time, seeing opportunities of how open-ended they are or how open-minded they are and how much data do, do they have for practicing the things that you have though they may not like seem evident directly by looking at the job description or the roles. If those aspects of the core concepts of machine learning are there, it's okay to directly go as a machine learning or a software engineer and then share your ideas. It's fine. I think if the company is open-ended, they will encourage you to be the first person start ML there. That is one extreme. Yeah, but I think probably Daniel might have another perspective. No, I, I pretty much agree with you. Like, I, I would say, keep in mind that uh, you don't have to know everything from the job description. Like, uh, they they pretty much say there what their ideal candidate would be, but uh, uh, it's not necessary to, to know everything. Uh, and uh, I think uh, if, if you feel like you're ready, if you feel like, okay, so I don't know this thing, but uh, I know everything else, go for it without question. Uh, I agree also with uh, what Nitin said, like uh, go play to your strengths. Like if you, uh, like me, you had a background in uh, web development, so you could go for more um, um, kind of freelance uh, jobs uh, that, are more with uh, startups and things like that because they they tend to look for uh, people that uh, uh, know a bit of everything in a way in uh, in software engineering. But um, yeah, like d d don't uh, don't take it as uh, you know as mm -hmm. <laughs> word of God. Like uh, if uh, if they say they, you need everything from there, it doesn't really mean that you need everything from there. Uh, if you know you're good in most of them and you have a very good uh, knowledge in one of them particularly, play, play to that, play to that strength. Uh, it may just end up being uh, actually what they're mostly looking for. So in the end, you might get, uh, you might get a job because uh, they put the other skills there because, you know, most, uh, actually most, uh, job uh, posts uh, are put by HR persons. So they, they kind of put everywhere, everything that uh, they know the job should be, but uh, uh, it's not really accurate all the time. So the entering don't, manager might have a more specific, oh, these are the ones I really care yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. so what I'm trying to say is that you don't have to be scared at all. Like. Uh, uh, try it, you know, uh, if, if you're looking to get hired and you want to search for something, just try it and mostly try it on the jobs that you like, like the ones that you actually feel like they, that sound good, because there are, are a lot of them out there. So don't worry that uh, I should uh, look also at this because maybe I don't get anything else, you know. Mm -hmm. At some point you will get... Uh, uh, something like look at all three of us. Uh, we we didn't really start looking for them uh, very much. They kind of came to us because we just uh, persevered in following the in you know uh, learning. Fair enough. Um, one of the other one of the another question from Slido is that you know a lot of roles in machine learning. Uh, require uh, some form of higher education, whether that's a master's, sometimes a PhD um, in their job description. 
as, as someone who, um, you know, the, the requester of this question is an undergraduate, um, and so, you know, or, or someone who's just completed an undergraduate, how can they show that they have, you know, the relevant experience and skills? Uh, that, that's very close to, to my heart in a way, because uh, I'm dealing with that problem also, like uh, not dealing it with, with it now because I found something, but uh, at first uh, I kind of dreamt of, uh, you know, the, big, uh, the bigger jobs with uh, Google research or things like that. And indeed, for some of those bigger ones, uh, it's kind of mandatory uh, to, to have a, at least a master's, if not even a PhD. And you can see why mostly because uh, they're more interested in um, you being very good at research, at uh, knowing how, how to write a paper, not already knowing all, all of that, uh, that stuff. So if you, like for me, what the solution that I found, I didn't really got to go through with it in a way, but the solution that I found, uh, accepting of course, doing the masters and, uh, and the PhD was uh, write a paper, you know, uh, like uh, do some research on, on your own. Uh, it may uh, it may end up uh, being something valuable. And uh, if you manage to, to finish a paper on your own and uh, publish it, even like uh, publishing in uh, in certain areas, it's not easy. You can only do it through university, of course, um, which has its pros and cons, but uh, you can publish on your own mostly in some cases and still get some recognition for it. Uh, and if it's a pretty decent uh, work, I'm pretty sure you'll get uh, recognized for it. Oh. And I, I mean, uh, if you really want to go just for the big uh, big jobs that really ne uh, necessitate a PhD, then I guess you kind of have to do it. <laughs> uh, which I understand uh, most people's opinion on that because uh, besides uh, the big universities like the big Ivy Leagues universities, uh, you actually, in my opinion, you actually learn a bit more from uh, courses like from Coursera or things like that than from universities. Uh, you kind of get the, unfortunately, you kind of get the, the diploma from it just for the accreditation. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, you have to kind of look at the pros and cons and if it's worth it for you. Like, for example, why, why did I say that it's really close to my heart? Because uh, uh, this year I kind of wanted, I started uh, my master's again to finish it exactly for that purpose. And uh, unfortunately, my university isn't a very good one. Uh, and uh, like uh, I, I ended up uh, uh, not wanting to, to finish that just because comparing to the, to the courses that I, to the knowledge that I got from Coursera and uh, other courses online, um, the other knowledge was really not worth it in a way. I mean, I wasn't really learning anything. Uh, so you know, I preferred to to try and uh, master things on my own in a way. Like, uh, of course, if I ever get, uh, you know, enough money or things like that to apply for uh, Ivy League uh, masters, I would do it. But uh, I understand that most of us, like uh, more than 90% of us uh, don't have that uh, that opportunity. So... We are not alone. <laughs> we kind of uh, have to work with what we've got, you know. Uh, that's why it's so great. And I think most of us are so uh, grateful for uh, everything that uh, platforms like Coursera and Audacity and things like that uh, offer. Uh, I found that uh, especially the courses from Coursera were much better uh, structured than most of my university courses. Um, so we do indeed get to learn a lot from uh, from these and um, get to get to even a bigger uh, level in our careers because of them. 
in some cases than uh, you know uh, going the traditional way, let's call it, and uh, doing the the university courses. That being said, uh, you do need at least some kind of a bachelor's, I think, but that's I, I think uh, easier to obtain. Right? No. No, um, thank you for sharing that. Um, I think what you're speaking to is something a lot of our learners empathize with is, you know, the, do I want, do I want the actual knowledge or do I want, you know, the diploma um, for exactly. what it t theoretically signifies. And, and one of, you know, our founders uh, rash reasons for creating Coursera was very much what you said, like making sure that any type of education is accessible to everyone. So very, very fair point. Um, uh, I'd love to take up another question from the Slido community. Um, so this one says, what are the key skills to work as a machine learning engineer in big companies? Are they, are the skills rather practical or more theoretical? And I think Daniel, you spoke to this a little bit, but I'd love to hear from Nithin about your experience at LinkedIn um, of sort of, you know, big company uh, machine learning team culture. Uh, yeah, I think the main point that I want to stress is uh, once the project size grows and becomes like a multi-person, multi-quarter effort, uh, fundamentals of software engineering, um, I mean, it's it sounds weird, but yeah, that really helps. Um, so even though we are doing an ML project, we cannot forget that we need to collaborate with people the code needs to be checked in and versioned, and there should be some sort of testing to the code. All those pieces cannot be ignored. It only is harder to debug a problem in uh, a machine learning pipeline than another software engineering because of the data-driven nature of the problem. It's very hard to find out the problem. So it's hard. so those kind of fundamental principles of software engineering uh, really help. And of course, um, trying to leverage the open source also really helps um, to reduce the probability of uh, introducing bugs and errors. In that, in big companies, usually that is very important. Having very low latency, high performance code is kind of the minimum bar. <clears throat> and in ML, usually, if there is complex matrix multiplication and things like that, back propagation and all those complex operators, they are they need to be really written in a very fine manner to get that level of performance that the companies expect. So that's why I I really recommend like leveraging the existing open source frameworks where thousands of community members are already sharing their thoughts and trying to fix it, make it more and more efficient and uh, build on top of your software engineering skills that, that can get you to production and deployment faster and see your idea being used and helping a lot of people sooner. Um, that's a really great point. Uh, I can't speak about it yet, but we do have something in that vein that we're cooking up at Deep Learning uh, that will be coming out early next year. Um, and so it's, it's another course that Andrew will be teaching that is a little bit more in that vein of like, not just the, not just the machine learning, but like, how do you bring it to production? So um, stay tuned if you are, if for all the viewers, if you are interested in learning more about, um, you know, the upcoming courses, et cetera, that we have, um, please definitely subscribe to the batch um, on our website. Uh, so you can, you can stay updated, but uh, it, it's definitely a critical thing that we see over and over again is, you know, people who really do machine learning really well, but then when it comes to deployment, um, you know, struggle because they don't necessarily have the same fundamentals. Um, and so that sometimes it's like, you know, I'm speaking another language and we thought we were both speaking Python, but it's not. <laughs> um, so uh, that's definitely there. Um, it, another question, not from the Slido community, but just, uh, I guess, a little of my own curiosity is, you know, sometimes when, when a machine learning engineer is like building a, a model from scratch, um, do you... Do you feel that it's better to build from scratch and kind of know all the ins and outs and every line of code yourself, 
Or do you find that it's helpful to say, utilize a platform like TensorFlow that, you know, sort of helps you shortcut um, some of the, some of the basics and, and trust that, okay, the TensorFlow is doing some of the, some of it for me. And so I can focus on the more nuanced pieces of, of the specific problem I'm trying to resolve. Great. I could go first. Uh, um, what I could say is that uh, one, um, it's quite uh, good uh, when you're working out uh, with uh, TensorFlow, Keras, and all these other high level APIs because uh, uh, one. Kennedy, I'm sorry. I think you cut out for us for a little bit. Do you mind trying again? Okay. Uh, we'll move on. Um, uh, Daniel or Nathan, uh, any chance you guys have a point of view on, on the merits of building from scratch versus utilizing a platform? Um, I, I mean, uh, my point of view will be kind of uh, more towards, uh, yes, you, uh, TensorFlow and things like that do help you a lot. Um, I'm pretty sure that uh, at some point uh, for larger companies, like for, for Nitin, maybe uh, you do have to get more in depth with it. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, do some finance thing, things. Uh, from my point of view, like I'm working more at a startup and things are a bit more loose. We're, we're working more with uh, like proof of concepts right now and things like that. Uh, so. I don't really get to uh, uh, get uh, in the greedy stuff, you know. Um, but uh, that, that, that's why actually, you know, it helps a lot to have this, uh, these frameworks because uh, you get to do things really fast. And especially with uh, uh, the advancements in uh, transform learning, uh, tra transfer learning uh, in the past, from the past few years, that's, uh, that's a huge uh, help, like uh, uh, especially for, let's say, for my task right now uh, with NLP and things like that. Uh, a few years ago, you couldn't really do um, understanding of uh, of an intent of a, of a text uh, with just a little data. You know, you you had to do a big model. You had to train a lot of things and so on. Now. Uh, you actually get to use just uh, some model from uh, Google, from TensorHub, and uh, just fine tune it a bit with very little data, and you already have something. Like, of course, uh, down the road, you have to do more, but it's great that right now you can do uh, a lot. Like, you get to do a pretty complete uh, application without having to, uh, you know, use much more, uh, but I guess uh, maybe Nitin uh, has uh, some points on the other uh, end of the... Uh, no, I, I mean, uh, I, kind, I, I mostly agree with you. I would just like to say that if we start from scratch, um, we don't know the success of the project yet. If we take too long to finish the project to deployment, and then we realize it doesn't work or say there is another solution, it's too late. The style at least um, I prefer and I learned is uh, go lean and go deep fast, like do all the steps fast and whatever approach works for solving that way, uh, like choose it. Like if TensorFlow can cut and give you a shortcut to finish that piece of ML, use it, like leverage it. And then once uh, the first deployment is done, you can slightly expand the pieces which are not working as great as you want to in your first iteration. Very agile methodology almost. It's oh, like yeah. Start with yeah. like minimum viable product and then slowly build and expand and tweak as you need it. Yeah. Okay, very cool. Um, another, another question from our Slido community. Um, what steps should someone take if they're coming from a non-computer uh, science background, uh, but want to break into AI research? So not necessarily industry side, but rather research. 
could you guys share what you think would be helpful or necessary? Uh, I mean, this is pretty related to the, to the other question we had, like uh, if, you're, if you're interested in research, like really research, uh, then, uh, then I think, uh, of course, you, you should uh, try university courses and uh, go that route because uh, for research, that's really the best uh, uh, route in a way. Okay. Kennedy, do you have anything you'd like to add? Okay, uh, I would say um, coming from uh, an untechnical background uh, and uh, you have interests uh, to um, explore more to the academic research, I would say one way is to uh, try align yourself or be in a community that uh, shares similar values. And uh, by this, I mean, you would explore if there are already any existing uh, research groups or uh, um, uh, research paper reading clubs because uh, they would help you to more about uh, implementing research papers. Uh, you would also maybe look out uh, for uh, teams that uh, may be working on any research projects to be able to learn more from them, to get the guidance from them, so that you can make a well-informed decision on maybe the latest uh, developments in research and also trying to weigh your interests so that uh, one, uh, one way you're able to gain to at, at least have understand the ropes and uh, have that exposure first to the community that shares similar values. Uh, and also that community would also help you in terms of uh, making well-informed uh, decisions. Uh, and also another way is to also now start engaging them because also through that community, they can help you to be able to collaborate, uh, maybe in terms of, uh, uh, and uh, also guide you if the kind of research work or uh, uh, the trajectory that you want to take in the research field, is it viable? Is it uh, an area that has future prospects and all that? Uh, and also, um, uh, I would say uh, trying to also uh, take up uh, the mantle of uh, getting to uh, take up, do your own research, get to see, uh, in, because uh, you find that in research, it's more of uh, committing to a long-term problem, working on a problem for quite some time. So you also need to assess and look at uh, the kind of ideas you have. Are the ideas that you'd be quite excited to be working on, to be researching and uh, doing all the heavy work in two or three years and how significant it is. So I would say leveraging more to a community that's already there uh, will greatly help you in terms of uh, getting informed to make uh, informed decisions uh, and also to learn more from them to learn more what's working and how to go about to even apply what is needed uh, so that at least you're able to have a smooth path uh, 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 transitioning to AI for research and development. Yeah, very solid answer. I, I would uh, also add uh, that there are these residency programs um, by Google, Facebook, Uber, many companies actually, very big companies. Uh, initially, that was my strategy. I tried that strategy uh, uh, to get into this AI research. Uh, is to apply to that residency program because the requirement is not a PhD. Usually, they are looking for sometimes. I mean, at least Google in our three to four years back, I guess, was looking for non-CS backgrounds. Uh, so they want, they have a lot of CS engineers, but they wanted other engineers or uh, experts in other field, like to marry both these fields and kind of have a research product out of it. I don't know what they were doing, but yeah, you can, if you go to Google AI residency, similarly, there are many residency programs like that. Very cool. Um, duly noted, I'm making a note for myself. Um, and uh, one of the next questions from the Slido is, uh, let's say someone has completed that formal education, you know, they've, they've started building, uh, they started doing some competitions, they started doing some, you know, small little projects on their own. Um, how did you go about choosing an area to specialize in and, and then focusing on crafting your expertise in that area? So, you know, Daniel, you spoke a little bit about NLP, but Nitin or Kennedy, if you feel there's a particular area that is, you know, a specialization of sorts for you, feel free to chime in. Oh. Uh, so, like uh, I initially told, uh, initially I was good at data processing, those kind of tasks in ML. But slowly, I moved to the more advanced topic of AutoML, um, where you 
technically build a framework and the machine learning model is designed automatically for you um in that regard uh, i had very less or kind of no idea because none of the courses i took didn't have that topic so in in that uh, situation uh, all i had to do was go ahead and read up again papers and but do a bunch of youtube around and there were a lot of uh, resources individually that at that stage you have to pick on your own and choose make your own learning path but it is doable because you have all the necessary ingredients at that point to understand what they are talking about no very fair um kennedy or Daniel, if there's anything else you'd add about you know choosing your specialization within machine learning. Uh, great, uh, I could say like um, uh, like uh, what has worked uh, of my case, considering that uh, uh, I'll be starting off my uh, master's program early next year with um, the University of Michigan, majorly focusing in uh, uh, natural language understanding. Uh, I could say what informed me to. Uh, pick up uh, that niche area was one uh, because I had interesting ideas. Uh, I've had uh, ideas that uh, uh, I felt that uh, the best way that I could be able to uh, uh, build uh, solutions was to getting to learn more and uh, build up my expertise uh, in uh, in uh, natural language understanding. So one way I could say like that what has worked for me and influ uh, uh, influenced my decision towards um, uh, measuring my research in uh, natural language understanding is because I have uh, those ideas that I feel I would wish to implement. Uh, and also other different ways that uh, maybe um, uh, can help someone to uh, make a choice on a niche area to focus on could be maybe uh, because of the societal problems that are out there and uh, you'd, you feel that uh, uh, you would be able to tap into a particular area and uh, be able to come up with uh, solutions or be able to do more research or coming up with solutions. So that could also be another way that could inform you to, uh, or, uh, to be able to pick up an area, uh, to build your expertise and uh, be able to uh, uh, come up with solutions that solve problems in that specific domain. Fair enough. Um, and then uh, we are on to our very last question for the day, um, which is uh, a one sentence advice for all the people watching the event right now. Uh, what's something that they could say do this week to improve their chance of landing an ML job? Uh, I, I'll go first maybe, um, like in one sentence. Um, if you don't have one, make a plan uh, and arm yourself with a lot of patience and uh, follow it. <laughs> no, in short, because it's one sentence. So, <laughs> yeah, plus one on that actually. Like, have a lot of patience and don't give up. Uh, you will certainly succeed. There are a lot of options today. But besides that, I also want to add that. This AI landscape is very broad. So certainly there will be some opportunity there uh, that where you will be the best person to uh, do it. So sharing your skills and your ideal next role um, as an AI practitioner, either in your resume or on LinkedIn or directly talking to the recruiter, that really, really helps. So just make sure that that is very clearly stated Great. Uh, I could say um, keep learning, uh, keep sharing more to your work, keep sharing more to your progress, to the projects that you're working on. And uh, people out there, recruiters and everyone is watching and uh, along the way prospects uh, and offers will come away. So stick to learning, get to share more to what you're doing, uh, get to uh, receive the feedback from uh, the larger AI community and uh, along the way opportunities will come your way. Awesome. So make a plan, have patience, share your work, keep learning, and know that there's a role out there that needs your particular skill set. It's just a matter of finding it. Yeah. Awesome. Um, well, that brings us uh, to the end of today's event. Thank you all for this very insightful discussion. And thank you, speakers, for joining us today. Um, we hoped, uh, learner, uh, viewers, we hope you've enjoyed today's event. We're going to send out a follow-up email with a survey for all of our attendees today. We'd love to hear about how we can make our future events better. 
we're also giving out a 50% discount code for any of our online courses to up to 200 people who submit qualifying responses. So keep an eye out, make sure to send your feedback in. And if you'd like to attend more of our learner community events, please check out our Slack workspaces or subscribe to our newsletter. We look forward to seeing you next time. And as always, keep learning. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.